everybody uh, in welcoming you to the Odyssey Church. And uh, not just because you were brave enough to come out in 19 degree weather, but uh, because it's Valentine's Day as well. And I don't know if you uh, caught that first song, uh, All We Need Is Love, All We Need Is Love. And in a way that's true, but I, I really believe that love is probably one of the most misunderstood words in the English language. You know, we, we think about Valentine's Day as being this uh, a romantic holiday, and it is. So I'm thinking that today's Valentine's Day, so I, I'm going to get this real romantic message. I'm going to give you this thing that's uh, real mushy and uh, real sappy. And I really hope you get that somewhere else, because I got nothing. Uh, <laughs> just ask my wife. <laughs> but one of the questions becomes, do you know why we even celebrate Valentine's Day? You know, most of us just think it's about you know exchanging cards and giving some candy and maybe a heart to somebody that's special in our life, maybe our significant other, our spouses, uh, to show them how much we love them. But according to legend, it's meant for people to remember a specific person. It's meant for somebody to remember a brave man, a martyr, a man by the name of Valentine. Uh, the Roman Emperor Claudius II was fighting a lot of wars, and he wanted a strong army, and he felt that most of the men would rather stay home and be with their wife and kids than go to war and fight. So he did the most logical thing he could think of, and that was to outlaw marriage. I mean, if you can't stay home and fight with your family, you might as well go out and fight the wars. So, uh, that's not true, okay? They'd stay home because of a lot of not for fighting. But uh, figured if, you, if you couldn't stay home and get married, then you would go out and, and you would fight. So, I'm not saying that Emperor Claudius II was very uh, vain or, or uh, very conceited or anything like that, but he actually outlawed Christianity as well. And he outlawed Christianity um, so that he and he alone could be worshipped as the one true God in Rome, as the Emperor Caesar uh, Claudius. Now, Valentine was a devout Christian. He was a priest. And he thought that everybody should be free to love the one true God, Jesus Christ, to, that you should be able to get married because he didn't want people living together outside of marriage and committing sin. So as a priest, Valentine began to secretly marry people, uh, even though it was against the law. And eventually, Valentine is caught. He's brought before Emperor the Claudius II. And imagine this now. Yeah, this guy is so well-spoken. This, this St. Valentine we call him today is so well spoken and, and is such a wise young man that Claudius tries to persuade him to become a Roman. He even tells him, he says, I'll pardon you, I'll make you one of my allies, all you have to do is quit marrying people and quit being a Christian. But Valentine, Valentine's faithful to the God he loves. He's faithful to Jesus Christ. He would not deny his belief, so the emperor handed down a three-part execution setting. He would be beaten, he would be stoned, and he would be beheaded. They beat him, stone him, and then cut off his head. Now while he's in prison waiting for all this to take place, Valentine falls in love with his jailer's blind daughter, a girl by the name of Asterias. Now during his stay in prison, while he's waiting for his execution, he would write to Asterias and he would tell of his love for her. He'd write to his friends and asked for prayer. He always signed his letters, remember your Valentine. Now it's plain before he was executed on February the 14th, 269 AD, that Asterias miraculously received her sight. So today we celebrate Valentine's Day on February the 14th every year so that we honor this man, this Valentine who was willing to die rather than deny Jesus Christ. Amen. Valentine lived a life that was worth living. And because he did, we continue to celebrate that life today. As Tara said in the earlier uh, greetings, that uh, sometimes you know we have these great tribulations in life. We have these great trials in our life. But sometimes the greatest witness to your faith, the greatest witness to your life overall, and the most meaningful witness to your life is some of the greatest trials that we go through. St. Valentine was a martyr. A martyr is defined as somebody who's willing to endure great suffering, even death, rather than deny their what their beliefs are. St. Valentine would rather die than deny his God. So if you've been coming 
to the Odyssey Church for a while. You may know this, or you may never even really pay attention to it. I often like to start out uh, the service by asking you a question to sort of draw you into what God has to say this morning. Uh, and today is no different. Uh, the question I want you to think about this morning is this. What are you living for that's worth dying for? What are you living for that's worth dying for? Now, I think this is an important question because everybody says, I want to live a life worth living. But you know, all of a sudden, I don't know about you guys, sometimes I, I get so tied up in life and making a living that we lose our passion that's required to live a life worth living. You know, my, my dad was a great man. He was a tremendous man. I mean, he made a good living. He provided for us most better than most fathers did. He, he was well respected among his friends. He was respected by his peers. Uh, and he died suddenly in 2003. And 13 years later, you know, really, no one outside his immediate family, you know, or, or very rarely anybody outside his immediate family ever mentions his name. You know, he got all wrapped up in living or making a living, and uh, he w he was a good man, and he made a good living. But today, um, very few people even remember him. So um, that's sort of why I want to ask this question, because Jesus Christ uh, calls us to have a life worth living, not just to make a living. He not only calls us to make a life worth living, he tells us that he's already planned this out for us, that he already has a purpose for our lives. He already wants us and desires us to live this abundant life, to have this life that's worth living. But not only does he call us to live a life worth living, he calls us to live the Christian life in such a way that to, to live it in, in such a way that's worth living that we would even die for it. Now those aren't my words. Those are the words of Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark at near the end of the 8th chapter, Jesus calls all the crowds together. He calls all the people and you know, by this time I'll a lot of people are following. He calls everybody over, including his disciples, and he said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Now, we read that la 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 sometimes, but keep this in mind. Jesus had never gone to the cross at this point in time. All these crowd knew was the cross was an instrument of painful and horrible execution. So he, he's saying, deny yourself, pick up your execution if necessary and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it for what would it be profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul and i think what jesus is saying just basically is he's saying this he says what good is it to make a living and then lose your passion for living a life that's worth living what good is it to make a good living and gain a lot of stuff in this world but lose your soul in the process. The Christian life is one of surrender. The Christian life is one of dying to self, to live for Jesus, to surrender our will to his will, for us to live for the one who died for us. It's what we're called to remember during this Lenten season, as we head towards Easter, as we head towards our great hope of the resurrection of our own lives through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So are you just making a living, or are you starting to live a life worth living? just read a quote by Benjamin Franklin. I thought it was a great quote. He said, uh, most people die at 25, but they aren't buried until 75. Mm. What are you living for that's worth dying for? Now, I'm going to try to illustrate this, and since I'm only a man, I've been praying for God's Holy Spirit to touch this message to do what's impossible for me and to illumine or to open the Scriptures to your heart this morning. And we started a series last week called Eight Days and Alive Again. We're, we're talking about a different day of the week uh, before Jesus' resurrection. Last week we introduced a series with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And at the end of the day, he went into the temple, he looked around, and, and whatever he did must have bothered him. You're going to see that this morning. Whatever he saw on that triumphal entry, he didn't like it. So he goes back to Bethany. And then the next day, he, he gets up and he starts to head back to Jerusalem. Now this is the morning, this is the morning of the Monday, of the last Monday of Jesus' earthly life. And if this was actually the week before the resurrection, if this was the Easter week or, or what the church knows as Holy Week, this would be the Monday 
before Jesus' death. So today we'll discuss the Monday and Holy Week, and then next week we'll discuss the Tuesday, and then the following week we'll discuss the Wednesday, which ought to be pretty interesting because Wednesday's called the Sabbath day. Uh, the scriptures don't record a whole lot about what took place on Wednesday, so who knows, maybe we'll just sit here and look at each other. <coughs> the scriptures may be silent, but you know I can't be quiet, so I'm sure God will be silent. <laughs> So, um, we're going to go over a different day of Holy Week, all the way up to when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. Now, this morning, the, the scripture is found in, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 21. And actually, we're going to look at the beginning of 12, towards the end of 21, and then we're going to talk about what's right in the middle. So, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to the Gospel of Matthew, I'm sorry, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. And we're going to start in 12. I'll be there in a few minutes. Uh, and as I promised, if you don't have a Bible or you like the translation I speak out most often, the New Living Translation, or if you know somebody who needs a Bible, the New Order came this week, so we got plenty of them right by the front door. Please grab one. They're free. They're our gift to you. But uh, I'm going to tell you what my goal is first thing this morning, in case you have to leave or in case you fall asleep while I'm talking and whatever happens. Uh, I'm going to let you know right up front. My goal is to help you live a life worth living to help you live for something that's worth dying for. And I'm going to start by making a simple observation about Jesus and how we talk to the different people. Now, now if you've read your Bible, or, or maybe it's been pointed out in sermons to you before, uh, one thing that I've noticed about Jesus, maybe you notice this too, is Jesus talked to the people who were outside differently than he talked about the people that were inside. He talked to the religious people different than he talked to the non-religious person. And and put it another way, he talked to the sinners differently than he talked to the so-called saints. He talked in a different tone, a a different language, and and even with different presentation of his message. And at the Odyssey Church, I want to preach the full counsel of the gospel. You know, uh, sometimes you get that feel-good mission, filled with love and with passion and with hope and grace and mercy. And we need to hear that message, and we need to hear it often. But sometimes you sort of get a message that steps on your toes. And, you know, I don't know about you this morning at the end of it, but I can tell you as I was studying, as I was working on this, it stepped on my toes so that it hurt all the way up to the knees. Because I had to start thinking about my own life. So I want to start out this morning by reminding you that the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ never condones sin, but he never condemns the sinner in Scripture either. At least not at first. He doesn't condone the sin, but he doesn't condemn the sinner in the Scriptures. He always gives those who are in sin a chance and a choice. They get a chance and they get a choice. Jesus goes up to a tax collector. Now, a tax collector is somebody who had their own category of sin. When Jesus would speak to the people in a crowd, he would say to sinners and even the tax collectors and the harlots. I mean, Jesus said there are sinners and then there are sinners. And tax collectors and prostitutes, they're, they're sinners. They're, they're, so, they're so bad they get their own class of sin. And Jesus goes to the lowest of the low. He goes to this horrible sinner named Matthew, and he doesn't wait for him to get off work. He doesn't wait to meet for a problem. He walks right up in public to his tax collector's booth, And he never condemns Matthew. That's interesting to me. He just simply says to him, follow me and be my disciple. In other words, I'm going to give you a choice and a chance to quit sinning and come and follow me and learn.